I am Bob Jackson, a humble man. All I dreamed of was a life devoid of problems, with a beloved wife, children, and a cozy home. Now, I drive a Ford F-150, a cherished legacy from my late father, which he bequeathed to me 10 years ago. Even then, the car was 15 years old. My father, a professional carpenter and farmer, and my mother, who worked as a maid at the Route 66 Hotel on the outskirts of Bells, Tennessee, raised me in this unusual town. Growing up in Bells allowed me to experience the essence of typical small-town life. Bells was so small that when you met the Welcome to Bells sign, you could see the inscription on its reverse side, Thank you for visiting. I had the opportunity to attend elementary, middle, and high schools, as well as the Bells Mini Market located in the same building. All these years, I was known by the nickname BJ, and fortunately, the presence of my sister Carrie protected me from the attacks of bullies. This was mainly due to her connections with a local bandit, which made her brother inaccessible to all troublemakers. No matter what, my goal has always been a simple life. School was quite tolerable. I had a small circle of friends, a girlfriend, and a modest cart that served me for transportation. Perhaps it was time to think about tuning it, but my real talent was hunting, at which I excelled from the moment I learned to walk, or rather, to stumble awkwardly. I realized that I was holding a gun in my hands. Of course, it was just a pistol with a cork, but it sparked my interest. Therefore, when an army recruiter came to our small town, I realized in my heart that this was my chance to fulfill my dream of becoming an army ranger. My father may not have been thrilled with my decision, but he understood how important it was to make my own way in life. Therefore, after graduating from high school, I gladly joined the army. My place of service was a base in Bragg, North Carolina, a place that soon became both a training base and a home for me. But when I first appeared before the sergeant, his words cut me like a knife, get back on the bus and go home, he barked. He seemed to think ranger school was exclusively for adults, not for little boys like me. I was a little over 170 centimeters tall and wasn't heavy in weight, but it didn't bother me. I've been used to being underestimated for a long time. But everything changed after that first night in the field when the sergeant realized his mistake. He didn't underestimate me anymore. By the will of fate, it was the sergeant who was in front of the muzzle of my M60. It was late at night, three o'clock in the morning, and I alone discovered the movement of the sergeant in the forest. In the process of studying at ranger school, I exceeded all expectations and became the best student in my class. I couldn't help but feel immensely proud knowing that I had made my parents really proud of me. When my term of service in the army was coming to an end, I faced a lot of difficult tasks that made me think about the impressions I received. But I decided to keep these thoughts to myself and not share them with anyone. At my last job, I devoted my free time to getting an accountant's degree, during which I met a charming person named Brenda. She had a stunning appearance, blonde hair, and mesmerizing hazel eyes. Her presence couldn't help but attract attention wherever she went. Realizing her attractiveness, Brenda constantly received tempting offers. But Brenda had her own preferences in choosing a man, calm, balanced, and, most importantly, easily controlled. When Brenda met me, she immediately realized that I ideally suited these requirements. The only problem was that I knew perfectly well that she was too much for me, and I behaved accordingly. Whenever Brenda smiled at me, I quickly looked away. If she approached me, I quickly left. Eventually, the day came when I was waiting in the sermon chapel. Brenda noticed me and realized that she had to act quickly to catch me before I noticed her. When Brenda settled on the bench behind me, I expected her presence and quickly turned to face her. Yes, how can I help you? I asked, catching her off guard. Her surprise was quickly replaced by a warm smile, which made my heart melt instantly. Our love story began with this simple communication. From that moment on, we became a couple, inseparable and deeply connected to each other. When I introduced Brenda to my family, they were absolutely delighted. Her achievements spoke volumes. She received an MBA degree, took first place in her class, and was fluent in four languages. The whole city of Bells never ceased to be surprised that I had such incredible luck. It should be noted that Bells is a small town where everyone knows everyone's affairs. The population was approximately 225 people. My father was happy for me, but at the same time, 
He gave advice, be careful in your relationship with a woman like her, he emphasized. It is necessary to appreciate and love her as she deserves, but at the same time, maintain self-respect and not tolerate disrespect. He advised me to find a balance between satisfying her desires and not giving her everything she wants. Perhaps in some cases, I will have to be firm and say no, he added. That day, I swore an oath to my father and remained true to my promises. Time seemed to fly by quickly, and I didn't notice how ten years flew by. I was engaged in a successful audit business, and Brenda held the position of a middle-level sales manager in a reputable supermarket. Having no children, we were a real example of a harmonious married couple. From my point of view, everything was going as well as possible. After completing the audit at the client's factory, I decided to surprise Brenda and invite her to lunch. This was my first visit to her office, as I have always respected her professional space and never wanted to disrupt her work. Similarly, Brenda has never felt the need to call me while in the office. When she was late, she either called me or left a message at home to warn me. Having finally found out where Brenda's office was located, I headed to her secretary's desk, which was located outside the office in the corridor. When I stopped in front of the desk, Brenda's secretary asked, Who are you? I answered quickly, I'm Brenda's husband. She giggled and said, Go away. Brenda's husband is a tall, attractive blonde, six feet three inches tall, and he works on the floor above. Could you trouble Mrs. Jackson at the moment? I asked, I think we can resolve this misunderstanding. But my words were ignored as the secretary quickly contacted the guards. The security officers who arrived immediately grabbed me and began to take me out of the room. At that moment, Brenda came out of her office, not paying attention to the fact that her legal spouse was mistaken for some kind of abnormality, and she found herself on the arm of the very man described by the secretary. Brenda froze in perplexity but silently and motionlessly watched me being led away. She had no idea that I would eventually reveal her secret relationship with her boyfriend, John. Both Brenda and Don successfully deceived everyone at work, considering themselves a married couple. Everything got out of control immediately after I was taken out of the building. I immediately hurried to my modest apartment to pack my things. First, the weight of the gravity of the situation crushed me, but I could not deny myself my pragmatic nature. Deep down, I knew that Brenda's affair was not a fleeting one. If, according to her colleagues, she was married to this man, then their illicit relationship should have lasted for quite a long time. On the way back to the house, the phone scared me with its continuous ringing. Looking at the caller ID, I saw that it was Brenda's mobile phone. A mixture of emotions overwhelmed me, but I decided to ignore the call, letting it ring non-stop. Frustration grew, and I threw the device out of the car window, hoping to get rid of its annoying presence. When I got to my modest apartment, the chaos in my head reflected the disorder in the apartment. As I started to pack my things and reflect, it finally dawned on me why Brenda never wanted to have children, at least by me. I realized this with sadness, but it didn't change the situation. Brenda made a fool of me, and I couldn't put up with it. Can you imagine that Brenda's secretary informed her, with a touch of amusement, that some unremarkable man approached her and brazenly declared that he was her husband? Seriously, this guy was probably just delusional. They all laughed at the very thought of Brenda being involved with someone like me. I'm at a loss. I don't want to brag, but honestly, only in my wildest dreams would Brenda agree with me. Brenda suddenly realized that she had always considered herself superior to me. After all, I have always considered myself a simple person who fulfilled his destiny. Brenda finalized it before the end of the working day and went home, not knowing what to do next. She had made a mistake, and now I knew the truth, but she was sure that I would want to listen to her, and she thought that she could come up with a lie that I would believe. Arriving at the house, Brenda noticed that my car was parked in the usual place. Opening the door, she called me, but there was no answer, only silence. Brenda searched the whole house, but I was nowhere to be found. But Brenda remained calm and did not shed a tear. She didn't feel the need to dwell on it. From her point of view, I have fulfilled my destiny, and now she is ready to move on. Surprisingly, she felt relieved that she didn't have to explain the real situation to me. Two more weeks passed, and Brenda had lunch with Don, her colleague who was like her husband, along with several vice presidents of the company. 
Suddenly, a man dressed as a waiter approached her. The man introduced himself and asked, Are you Brenda Jackson? She answered without much excitement, but her curiosity did not leave her. The man handed her the package and simply said, You have been served. Brenda's face flushed with embarrassment. She hastily snatched the envelope and hurried to the lady's room. She was beside herself with rage because of how quickly it had happened. The audacity with which he served it in front of everyone during dinner was simply infuriating. When Brenda returned from the toilet, she was relieved to realize that Don had managed to resolve the situation. He informed the vice presidents that it was just an insurance case, saving her from further humiliation. Brenda was grateful for Don's presence. Three months later, Brenda was sitting in the lawyer's office and studying the divorce papers. She didn't ask him anything, but Brenda stumbled upon unpleasant facts herself. From the lawyer's explanations, it became known that I had successfully sold my company, which Brenda was interested in. Naturally, Brenda demanded to know the identity of the buyer, to which my lawyer calmly replied, it was Carrie, the boy's sister. Surprised, Brenda asked at what price the company was sold, to which he also calmly replied, she paid two dollars. Then he promised Brenda that she would receive her share in the mail as soon as the divorce was finalized. At the same time, a smug grin appeared on his face. Confused and offended, Brenda turned to her lawyer, asking how I could do this because the company is considered common property, which gives her the right to have. Disappointed, she started screaming and asking why I wasn't there. She asked insistently, louder and louder. My lawyer looked at her cheerfully and grinned. Then he took his briefcase, handed the business card to her lawyer, and quickly left the office. Meanwhile, I returned to my late father's house in Bells and began discussing with him a possible real estate offer. After my father's death, the farm was jointly owned by Carrie and me. There were rumors about Nissan's plans to open a plant in Tennessee. During the conversation with me, the vice president responsible for the development of Nissan showed interest in building a plant on our territory with Carrie and Bells. Our farm, with an area of just over 200 acres, was quite suitable for the size criteria desired by Nissan. In addition, the convenient proximity to the motorway, as well as the presence of an existing railway line on one side, made this place ideal. All residents of the city understood the importance of this opportunity because the creation by Nissan of a new assembly plant in Bells will inevitably attract other enterprises to this area. Carrie and I came to a mutual agreement on a deal worth $35 million, which we decided to divide among ourselves. In addition, Nissan signed a six-year contract with Carrie for the provision of consulting services. After the land deal was completed and the vice president asked me about my future plans after the sale of the business, I told him that I hadn't really thought about my immediate future. To which he told me that as part of the verification process, Nissan conducted a thorough check, including checking my biography. We would like to know if you would like to take the position of the new head of accounting at the plant, he said. It was unexpected. I am very surprised by this opportunity. Naturally, I need to carefully study the entire package of documents that Nissan offers. However, initially, I am inclined to agree. Yes, I agreed. At this time, Brenda and Don received information about Nissan's plans to build a factory in Bells. Brenda and Don imagined themselves as an influential couple in Bells, but in order for this to become a reality, Brenda needed to complete the divorce. She decided to agree to my settlement agreement and speed up the divorce process. She asked her lawyer to speed up the trial, and within 45 days, Brenda and I were legally separated. Shortly after the divorce was finalized, Brenda entered into a marriage, not with Don, at an intimate ceremony in a wedding chapel in Las Vegas. Rumors about this reached me through unofficial channels, and although I did not approve of it, I chose to remain silent. Meanwhile, I started working at the newly created Nissan factory, giving 110%. The top management quickly appreciated my abilities, and before I knew it, I was already climbing the corporate ladder. After the divorce, I achieved success both personally and professionally. I succeeded in my role as Vice President of Finance and Administration, which now included overseeing the Human Resources Department. Our professional relationship with Henry Masaji, an experienced Nissan employee and Executive Vice President for the region, has developed successfully. 
Henry appreciated my straightforward management style, and our relationship became even stronger because there was a deep sense of respect and friendship between us. When Henry asked for a meeting in his office, I didn't quite understand its purpose. To my surprise, Henry told me that Nissan had acquired a department store chain located next to Bell's in order to continue its work and achieve success. Henry told me further details and instructed me to evaluate the acquired business, paying special attention to the staff of the head office and its payroll. When I returned to my office, I began to conduct an extensive analysis based on the information received. Then, a number of recommendations were drawn up, which were to be presented to Henry and contain the necessary steps to combat the financial crisis. In the end, it became clear that in order to stop the ongoing financial losses, it is necessary to lay off about 10% of the management staff and almost 15% of the hourly workforce. After Henry received the plan I proposed, it was time to break this sad news to the management team. All managers were gathered in a specially designated place where folding chairs were placed for their convenience. In front were two large tables on either side of the podium. Brenda and Don wanted to talk to Henry alone before word got out about the reorganization, but Henry asked them to wait for my arrival without mentioning my last name. When I suddenly walked into the room, Brenda's ex-husband, Brenda, and Don were stunned. The surprise on their faces did not go unnoticed by Henry. In response, Henry casually exchanged a few words with me in Japanese. I grinned and answered in Japanese too, leaving Brenda at a loss as to my knowledge of the language. Despite being considered a simpleton, I had a few unexpected surprises up my sleeve. She came back to reality and realized the gravity of the situation. The fact that I communicated with the management team sent from Nissan Japan and spoke in a native language was a clear sign that something was wrong. Feeling greatly impressed, Brenda, as well as Don, realized the seriousness of the situation unfolding in front of her. I explained the reasons for the lack of severance payments for Brenda, Don, and other dismissed middle managers. This discovery came as a shock to them because they knew that the owners and top management received significant financial benefits known as golden parachutes when they sold the company to Nissan. Unfortunately, the company had exhausted its funds, and Nissan was forced to inject significant amounts of capital just to maintain production. Accordingly, the dismissed managers could only count on minimal assistance in the form of state unemployment compensation, which was very meager. In addition, I informed the middle managers about the upcoming layoffs and told them about our decision made by Henry and me to cut 25% of middle managers instead of reducing staff. At the end of my speech, Henry said that the HR department will hold individual meetings with each manager to determine who will remain in the company. We were informed that the interviews will be scheduled and the venue will be announced in advance. As I was leaving, Brenda tried to get my attention, but I ignored her and continued the conversation with Henry completely oblivious to her presence. Don turned to Brenda and expressed his bewilderment. This is a layoff at Wolf State, he said. Brenda, with a worried expression on her face, replied, Yes, that means they can fire us for any reason or no reason at all. Don looked at Brenda, puzzled by her lack of understanding of the business. He thought for a moment before addressing her. Brenda, you have to find a way to win back the favor of the village guys, he said. Brenda looked at him incredulously and asked, And how exactly do you suggest I do this? Do I have to figure out this situation? I'm not sure. It was you who deceived him, so it is your duty to correct the situation. Moreover, if necessary, go to extreme measures. It shouldn't be a big problem for you because you cheated on him for many years while you were married. Please understand the gravity of our situation. We have a mortgage on the house and bills to pay. If one of us loses his job, we will have serious financial problems. To make matters worse, we won't even get the promised severance pay. It's really terrible. Brenda glanced at Dawn but said nothing. It was another moment when Brenda felt humiliated. Over the years of his married life, Don often used his wife for his own purposes, treating her like a commodity when he needed someone to implement his plans to earn money. In addition, Don used her to satisfy his own intimate desires, ignoring her opinion and treating her as if she belonged to him. As a result, Brenda and Don made an appointment for the evening. Following the directions, they arrived at a spacious 25-acre ranch. Arriving at the ranch, Brenda and Don saw that its owner, Henry, must be incredibly rich. They started ringing the doorbell, the door swung open, 
and they were greeted by a delightful southern beauty. Greetings, she said, and the air was filled with her charming southern accent. My name is Pam. Come in and make yourself at home. Once inside, they were immediately charmed by the picture that opened up in front of them. The house resembled one of those luxurious mansions shown on television. Going further, they noticed that their colleagues were happily inspecting the room. Laughter and excitement filled the air because many people knew that this meeting marked the end of their work in the company. But today was a holiday, a time to enjoy the moment. The tantalizing aroma of barbecue wafted through the halls, complementing the festive atmosphere. Brenda and Dawn immediately noticed Henry and headed towards him. Brenda expressed her admiration, saying, Sir, your house is simply magnificent. Henry grinned at her compliment but immediately corrected them. Oh no, this is not my house. At that moment, I came up to them and, after a brief glance in their direction, again addressed Henry in Japanese. Brenda was getting more and more worried as it seemed that I didn't notice her presence at all. Feeling a little offended by my discourtesy, Brenda asked, Bob, what did you just say? Brenda asked my opinion about the house, doubting that it belonged to me because it clearly could not be mine. Henry, smiling mischievously, said that the house really belongs to me. At that moment, Pam came up to us. She told me to ask Jeff to bring another 30 bottles of wine and five cases of beer from the wine cellar. I agreed and went to the intercom to give the necessary instructions. Henry noted, you've really renovated the house beautifully. Pam gratefully responded to Henry's compliment, thank you very much, Henry. Your kindness is very valuable. Curious, Henry asked about the newly installed pool, and Pam and Henry went to him. Brenda and Don followed, intrigued by what was happening. When they went outside, they were amazed by what they saw. In front of them was a pool located in a grotto, a stunning miracle of enormous size. Henry tactfully inquired about the value of the house, prefixing his question with a soft tone. Pam answered honestly, it's worth about $4 million. Carrie lives in a house that costs about $2 million. By the way, if we talk about Carrie, how is she doing? She recently gave birth to another child, and this baby is just adorable. Every time I catch a glimpse of Carrie's baby, I tell Bob that we should also think about starting a family. Coincidentally, I came over just in time to listen to her comment. In a joking manner, I patted her on the back and said, Don't worry, dear, soon we will be expanding our family. In the meantime, let's focus on spending the rest of the evening together. Don made a stupid decision by contacting the wife of a jealous man, which led to serious consequences for him. No wonder Don had a terrible evening. As a result, Brenda and Don were on the list of employees being cut. In the end, Pam fulfilled her long-awaited wish. She gave birth to twin girls, and a few years later, we had a son who looked very much like me. A year later, Don and Brenda separated and divorced. One evening, Don returned home accompanied by several colleagues from work, unaware of this. Brenda overheard Don describing her as a person when they first met. The next morning, Don noticed that Brenda had left, leaving behind a note that said, I chose myself, not you. Don, indifferent to Brenda's care, always perceived her as nothing more than an object for intimate pleasures and nothing more than a corrupt woman. Tragically, a month later, Don was found dead in his bed. The results of the tests showed that he was HIV positive. Meanwhile, Brenda was living in poverty with another smug and aggressive man. Her life turned into a real horror. According to my sister, who often saw Brenda at the supermarket working as a cashier, she looked terrible. Carrie said that Brenda had bruises on her face and on her hands. She said it was clear that my ex-wife was a victim of domestic abuse. But I didn't want to hear and know all this at all because this woman died for me, and I didn't feel sorry for her at all. She herself took such a step towards such a terrible life. Carrie often told me about Brenda, but I always asked her not to remind me of this person. My sister is very gentle and kind, and she felt sorry for my ex-wife. One day, my sister called me again, and she was crying bitterly. Carrie said that Brenda needed help, that she was in a terrible state. The man with whom she lived severely beat her and inflicted serious injuries. And now, Brenda cannot move independently and even sit after the brutal beating. She was left disabled and alone without any support. 
Perhaps you will consider me a cruel person, but I do not feel sorry for this lying, duplicitous woman at all. After talking to my upset sister, I asked her never to mention my ex's name again. Story 2 I have an incredible story that happened to me and my wife, Jennifer. We've been together for nine years since we were school friends. It's like we came out of a fairy tale. We crossed paths at a forced school dance, and from that moment on, we were inseparable. People perceived us as the perfect couple, but deep down, we had different dreams about the future. I aspired to law, burying myself in books to become a lawyer. Jennifer, on the other hand, aspired to life in Hollywood, wanting to become an actress. I was totally supportive of Jennifer, although I couldn't deny that I felt nervous about how we were going to move on our own roads. While I was knee-deep in law textbooks, Jennifer tirelessly went to auditions all over the country. Interestingly, despite the fact that she was two years older, I graduated before her because she was a grade below me. It remained a mystery to me because every time I asked about it, she started to defend herself. Looking back, I can say that if I had known the truth, maybe we would have reconsidered our relationship then and there. But rest assured, the reason will become clear later. After graduating from high school, I went abroad to study law, and so our journey into the field of long-distance relationships began. I already foresaw skepticism, but I firmly decided that we would succeed. We talked every night, I always came to her for holidays and special occasions. Sometimes she was unavailable for communication for various reasons, but I didn't dwell on it. But after graduation, she broke unexpected news to me. She announced her desire to study acting in Europe. Long-distance communication within the same country is one thing, but now we were faced with an even bigger problem, being separated by a whole ocean. I couldn't help but feel a sense of anxiety, but Jennifer reassured me, promising endless phone calls and late-night conversations to overcome this distance. Time flew by. She continued to pursue acting in Europe, and I stayed here, immersed in law textbooks. On the way, I met many interesting people, including women, but our communication remained purely friendly. Exams at the Faculty of Law, two A's, and the upcoming bar exam all my attention was focused on my studies. Several years passed, and I successfully graduated from the Faculty of Law and passed the bar exam. I got a job at an average law firm where I specialized in corporate contracts. Maybe it wasn't an exciting career choice, but it provided me with a stable income. Meanwhile, Jennifer returned to the United States and actively participated in auditions. Although she faced a number of rejections, in the end, we formalized our relationship and got married. Despite the fact that we had been together for several years, over time, I climbed the career ladder in a law firm, and Jennifer managed to get a few small acting roles. We decided to move out of a cramped apartment and bought a house in Virginia. Although the price for it was considerable, fortunately, my stable job and good credit history allowed us to pay it comfortably. We successfully got a mortgage loan. But then trouble happened. The CEO of my firm was involved in an embezzlement scandal, which led to the collapse of the entire company. My job disappeared overnight. In addition, we had accumulated debts, and if we could not cope with the mortgage payments, we risked losing our new home. When I told my wife this news, we cried together from the bottom of our hearts, and then gathered and began to think about solutions to stay afloat. We considered selling the property or looking for a part-time job. For example, Jennifer took on the role of a hamburger peddler. Our attempts to save the situation were like putting a band-aid on a rapidly sinking ship, it would not be enough. The closing date of the mortgage loan was approaching, increasing our pressure. But a few days before we were on the verge of financial collapse, my wife broke the amazing news. She signed a major contract with television. She kept silent about the details, emphasizing their top-secret nature, and said that it would not even be made public. Although it aroused some suspicions in me, desperate times require desperate measures, don't they? As time went on, my wife continued to gain experience as an actress and expand her repertoire. We've all heard about the extreme measures that TV shows take to prevent spoilers, so I didn't dwell on the mystery surrounding my wife's new job. In addition, the solid salary she received was more than enough to pay the mortgage. When our financial problems were solved, life seemed to return to normal, and I found myself on cloud nine. At times, I almost wanted to remain blissfully unaware of the cracks that had begun to appear in our marriage. 
But time flew by, almost half a year passed without nightmares about losing the house. We finally got rid of this burden, or so it seemed. Just three months later, I managed to get a new job at a small law firm that was more concerned with protecting the interests of the public rather than corporate activities. Although the salary was lower, I felt like a full-fledged assistant to ordinary people in need of help. At the same time, my wife's acting career seemed to have soared to new heights. Her salary grew every year, but she kept her professional endeavors secret, providing little information about her performances. As time went on, I couldn't shake the growing suspicion that something was wrong. It seemed to me that the desire to achieve transparency and understanding of what she does was not unreasonable, especially since her career had largely contributed to the payment of the mortgage loan. And it seemed fair to me to want to get at least some idea of her work. But I dismissed my suspicions as paranoia and decided once again to leave everything as it is. In the end, I had more important tasks, such as a new job and personal development. By the way, I went on a new diet and decided to go to the gym three times a week. Jennifer also seemed to be making an effort, dressing flawlessly and applying makeup before leaving the house. Strangely, our intimacy decreased, and we rarely went on dates anymore, leaving me with a feeling of bewilderment and detachment. Seeing how at ease she looked at a million dollars, I was puzzled. I understood that the television industry makes high demands, but I didn't know what was hiding behind its impeccable appearance. Looking back, we can say that this whole situation looks unreal, as if made up. The story took an unexpected turn when one day, an anonymous benefactor decided to reveal Jennifer's secret to me. When I arrived at work, I saw a plain white envelope neatly hidden in my desk drawer. My name and an urgent message were written on it in bold letters, read it immediately. With curiosity and apprehension, I carefully opened the envelope, and a series of photographs appeared in front of me, from which my jaw dropped in disbelief. In the pictures, Jennifer was depicted in an environment eerily reminiscent of a strip club and engaged in activities that destroyed my idea of our reality. At first, I treated it as a possible mistake or a carefully thought-out prank, which I would laugh at later. The photos that caught my eye were not quite clear, which left room for doubt and mistaken identification. Desperately clinging to hope, I convinced myself that all this was just a misunderstanding or a malicious joke. But no one came to calm me down or dispel my fears which only made my worries worse. Deep down, I knew I couldn't ignore this nagging feeling anymore. Having some funds accumulated during my previous work on a voluntary basis, which I performed before my current job, I decided to hire a private detective. It was necessary to get to the truth, even if it meant facing disturbing revelations that I wasn't quite ready for. I couldn't bring myself to engage in clandestine activities like hanging out at strip clubs or something worse. Besides, if my suspicions were groundless, it would be unfair to expose my wife to unnecessary worries. But I knew I had to get to the truth, whatever it was. I couldn't afford to hire a private investigator, but I appreciated the thoroughness. The detective got to the origin of the photos, not afraid to get his hands dirty in search of answers. A day later, a detailed report and high-resolution photos were placed on my desk, leaving no doubt. It was clear in black and white that my beloved wife, Jennifer, with whom I had lived for nine wonderful years, played the main role in an elite club of lovers of intimate entertainment. My heart ached, there was a strong pressure in my throat, and it became difficult to swallow. I felt like a blow was being rapidly delivered to the chest. The shock of what I learned hit me like an icy wave. Nine years of marriage, dreams of starting a family after we paid off the mortgage, all this now hung in the balance. I felt deprived of sight, I was overcome by a sense of betrayal. It was impossible to imagine that Jennifer, my life partner, could be involved in such a secret life. I was desperate for answers. That evening, I sat alone in the living room and waited for her to return, hoping that she would offer some explanation for the broken trust between us. The night went on, and several hours passed before I heard the sound of a key turning in the lock. When she came in the door, I saw a flash of surprise on her face that I was not asleep. I was usually sound asleep by the time she got home. Looking back, I should have realized that this was a wake-up call, but sometimes clarity comes only with hindsight. The weight of evidence weighed on me, but I wanted to give her a chance to explain. Taking a deep breath, I asked her directly why she worked in a club for lovers of intimacy. Her reaction was instantaneous. She froze in place as if caught off guard. No, 
I don't work in such a place. Why do you say that? Confused Jennifer asked, where my accusations came from. She couldn't understand why I made such conclusions. Despite the outburst of anger, I managed to remain calm, insisting that she be honest with me. I did not want to leave this issue without attention, but Jennifer continued to deny her involvement in what was happening, casting incredulous glances at me as if doubting my sanity. Not wanting to let her dismiss my concerns, I took the plunge, pulling out the incriminating photos. I spread them out one by one, carefully watching her reaction as her eyes scanned each image. I noticed that her face was losing color, and an unconditional sense of guilt emanated from her like the intense heat of an oven. At that moment, all my doubts about the authenticity of the photos evaporated. To my surprise, Jennifer didn't lie or defend herself anymore, she just collapsed in front of me, sobbing uncontrollably. Through tears, she confessed that her participation in this club was connected with a desperate attempt to save our house for the sake of our future together. She expressed deep shame and remorse, acknowledging to what depths she had sunk. She begged for understanding, explaining that she couldn't bear for me to find out the truth and wanted to hide it. But despite her tearful pleas, the feeling of betrayal only intensified, disturbing all my instincts. Disappointment and annoyance were born in me when I pointed out to Jennifer that her fear of my disappointment did not give her the right to betray me in this way. Her apology looked like a weak attempt to cover a deep wound, just a plaster on a broken bone. She tried to justify herself by saying that she never wanted to hurt me and did not want me to find out her secret. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. How could she expect that such an excuse would be enough to compensate for the pain she caused? My questions moved to the future. I asked about her plans for the future. I reminded her that I got a new job a few months ago, and we could have handled the mortgage if she hadn't resorted to these night outings. She seemed confused, unable to give a satisfactory explanation. At that moment, I realized that I didn't need to hear anything anymore. Everything fell into place like pieces of a puzzle. Designer brands hanging on hangers, luxurious decor decorating our house, and her wardrobe for a thousand dollars, all of this suddenly made sense. How could I not notice? This reality hit me like a hard punch in the stomach. Jennifer was no longer a modest actress chasing her dreams, she had turned into a highly paid object of desire. One question hung in the air, did she enjoy all this money, fame, and everything that went with it? She continued to be silent, and this silence stretched for me for thousands of kilometers. In the end, she asked, what should I do? Do you want me to quit this job? Tears welled up in my eyes as I tried to figure out how I could trust her again. At that moment, we stood in silence like two stone statues in a once huge but now crumbling monument of marriage, desperate for a miracle. My life seemed like a tasteless joke, a cruel twist of fate. And then she broke the silence, begging for a second chance and promising to give up her participation the very next day. I would like to say that I remained firm and cold, resolutely putting her out the door. To be honest, I struggled with my emotions and thought about driving her away. It would be a justified reaction, the right thing to do, and at times, I was very close to doing so. Divorce was a word I couldn't bring myself to say. The deep-rooted connection between us, the shared experience that shaped us, all this did not allow me to let them go so easily. Instead, against my better judgment, I said to myself, good. I decided to give her a second chance, albeit with caution. The next day, despite her objections, I insisted on accompanying her to the club to see for myself her resignation before my eyes. My wife ran into her boss, and I couldn't help but clench my fists at the sight of his smug grin. After this emotionally intense ordeal, we left together, seeking solace in our common path to the search for healing and reconciliation. In an effort to restore our connection, I decided to take a week off and devote it to reuniting with my wife. We returned to those moments of our youth when we were teenagers in love, remembered cute trifles, played silly pranks, and laughed. It was a nostalgic feeling, and for a fleeting moment, I allowed myself to believe that our relationship could be saved. Strange as it may sound, but it was thanks to my wife's previous work in this terrible place that we were able to keep our house. I, traditionally considered the breadwinner of the family, found it difficult to accept. But she quit right before my eyes and now we had the opportunity to devote more time to each other, renewing the desire to restore what was strained. Another week passed, and my wife began actively looking for new vacancies. 
At the same time, my law firm assigned me to conduct a lawsuit with a high bid of a million dollars, for which I had to go to Indiana. The prospect of long-distance trips again caused me a feeling of anxiety. Having received the promises and guarantees of my wife, I plucked up the courage and agreed to this job. At the airport, we passionately said goodbye, making promises to each other, hugging and kissing tightly. As I hit the road, I was overcome with excitement about my new professional role and anxiety that I had trusted Jennifer again. And so, I stood at the crossroads, ready to start a new chapter in my career and in my relationship. Faced with a choice either to trust my wife, who would remain faithful during my absence, or to terminate our marriage, I decided to trust her. I understood that someone might condemn this choice, but I believed in the possibility of redemption and growth for both of us. But at the very moment when everything began to work out as well as possible, Murphy's Law made itself felt again. The universe seemed determined to test me even more by challenging my resolve. I admitted that I was weak and showed that I still had a lot to learn about resilience and strength. Life had changed dramatically, forcing me to face new lessons. In the first few weeks of working in a new place, representing the interests of teenagers who found themselves on the verge of imprisonment in a colony, I realized that work brings true satisfaction. I was pleased to protect the interests of these vulnerable people, giving them a chance for a better future. It was the most meaningful job I was looking for. Despite the heavy workload, I tried to call my wife every evening during my trips. But after a few weeks, I couldn't help but notice changes in her accessibility and responsiveness. There were times when she couldn't contact me or didn't respond at all. Of course, she explained this by saying that she was looking for a job or running errands, and I took them at face value. And suddenly, when I was at work, a mysterious text message came. It was from the same anonymous angel who first warned me about Jennifer's secret life. Just the sight of this message again caused a surge of anxiety, and my heart started pounding again. Wasting no time, I quickly responded to the mysterious message and arranged a meeting at a local restaurant for the following Tuesday. The days leading up to this fateful day seemed to fly by painfully slowly, but finally, Tuesday came. After finishing work at 5 p.m., I went to the restaurant. Arriving a little earlier, I looked through the menu and randomly selected a dish although my attention was far from focused on the food. My attention was focused exclusively on the mysterious guest who was to unravel my life anew. It was already about six in the evening when an elegant woman gracefully entered the restaurant door. When she approached my table, I recognized her as the one I was waiting for. With confidence, she introduced herself, my name is Nancy, and you are probably Jessica's husband. Having confirmed her assumption, I couldn't help but feel a surge of curiosity. How did she get these defamatory photos? Sensing my intrigue, Nancy sighed heavily and replied, We used to work together in the same club. She began, her voice filled with memories. We worked the same shift and often spent breaks together. I worked at the club for three years before she came. I remember helping her settle in, completely unaware that she was hiding her marital status. Nancy paused for a moment, thinking about those days. I asked her if this was really the job she wanted, and she, without hesitation, confidently confirmed it. And foolishly, I believed her, Nancy continued. At first, Jessica went home immediately after the end of her shift, Nancy said, a note of concern in her voice. But over time, I began to notice changes in her behavior. She began to spend more time communicating with visitors and staff, especially with actors. She seemed to be in close contact with them. Besides, I couldn't help but notice how her style had changed. If in our work, we often had to wear glamorous outfits, then Jessica has moved to another level. She began to dress more and more luxuriously. After a short pause, Nancy took a deep breath and then talked about what happened on one of the eventful nights. Jessica invited me to go to a nightclub with her after work, Nancy recalls, a note of regret in her voice. In the end, we both drank more than we had planned although I had to drink less because I had work the next morning. Realizing the need to take responsibility for Jessica's state of intoxication, I ordered an Uber and decided to accompany her home. During the trip, she asked me why I decided to work at the club. I felt it necessary to talk honestly about my financial difficulties and unsuccessful attempts to find a job elsewhere. When I asked her the same question, she first answered that it was related to the mortgage payment, 
but then she finally admitted that she now works there because she really likes such a luxurious life. And then Nancy dropped a bomb that surpassed all the revelations told so far. It absolutely horrified me. She said that during a conversation while intoxicated, Jessica mentioned that she was talking the same way as her husband. The weight of those words hit me like a brick. Realizing my unconsciousness, Nancy confessed that she had taken those secret photos with the sole purpose of bringing the truth to me. Using social media, she managed to find my workplace and discreetly leave an envelope with evidence in my booth, hoping that this would lead to some kind of solution. The memory of that night when I ran into my wife flashed through my head. It all started for us, but she continued to live only for herself. This fact struck me like lightning, and I couldn't help but regret that I didn't trust my intuition. I scolded myself for being weak, for allowing my doubts to be dismissed as self-doubt. At that moment, Nancy noticed my silence and patiently waited for my answer. With gratitude for her frankness, I sincerely thanked her before telling her about my difficult decision to file for divorce. And yet, amid the turmoil, a sense of anxiety persisted. Just as I was preparing to file for divorce, I was overtaken by another shocking blow, a letter arrived with an unexpected turn of events. To my disbelief, Jessica bypassed me, accusing me of abuse, mistreatment, and even infidelity. The accusations seemed absurd. Besides, they were supported by a photo of Nancy and me taken in a restaurant. It became clear that Jessica was spying on me, invading my privacy, trying to manipulate the situation. Overcome with rage and anxiety, I realized that I had to remain calm even in the face of such unfounded accusations. Despite the available evidence and the constant public slander from my wife on social networks, I remained confident in the justice of these accusations. Having decided to act, the first thing I did was to rehire the same private detective. Armed with a lot of evidence against my deceived wife, I was ready to fight back. Jessica may have initiated the battle, but I was determined to make her regret it. After collecting all the information I received from the private detective, I carefully saved backups on my phone and computer, ensuring their safety for the upcoming battle. When everything was ready, I decided to take a bold step and contacted Nancy, asking her to testify on my behalf at the divorce hearing. Her knowledge and first-hand evidence would be invaluable in debunking Jessica's false accusations. Since my wife secretly filmed our conversation, she used it to accuse me of infidelity and other groundless offenses. After a long day spent in suspense, Nancy's answer finally came. She agreed to testify on my behalf, and all I had to do was give her the details. I immediately sent her a message informing her that the hearing was scheduled for next month. Having set the date, I spent the night carefully organizing and preparing for the impending completion of my wife's treacherous games. Time seemed to pass painfully slowly until finally, the day of the divorce hearing arrived. I picked up Nancy, and we went to the courthouse in Virginia together. When I entered the courtroom, I made sure that Nancy took an empty seat and gave her the opportunity to settle down quietly. Having adopted a strategic plan, I made a conscious decision to keep Nancy's presence in the courtroom a secret until it was her turn to testify. If my wife could blind me with even more lies, then I thought it would be fair if she was surprised by the truth that unfolded before her eyes. Arriving at the courthouse, I met with my lawyer, who joined me 15 minutes after Nancy and I had settled in. Soon, my wife appeared, accompanied by her relatives, a well-dressed man who turned out to be her lawyer, and a young girl who looked remarkably like my wife. The sight of these people caused a storm of emotions in me, but I remained faithful to my determination to resist the deception that destroyed our marriage. The opening speech delivered by my wife's lawyer was absolutely shocking. He accused me of the same infidelity that I accused my wife of. He claimed that I forced her to quit her job, deliberately prevented her from finding a new job, and even made false accusations against her when I got a more lucrative position. Further complicating the situation, he claimed that I sought to deprive her of the opportunity to receive alimony in any form, leaving her without means of livelihood. But the most outrageous accusation was yet to come. Allegedly, I refused to support our daughter, who allegedly needs financial assistance. The absurdity of this accusation surpassed anything I could have imagined in my wildest dreams. It was clear that my wife's lawyer intended to present me as the villain in this story, no matter how far-fetched and unfounded the claims were. The shock in the courtroom did not subside when my wife's lawyer demanded that the court oblige me to pay her alimony after our divorce. 
I was completely shocked by the audacity of this demand. Something didn't add up. My wife has never mentioned that she has a daughter, and her family has never hinted at the existence of a child. We didn't even think about starting a family, let alone raising an 11 or 12 year old girl. When I was desperately trying to comprehend these shocking revelations, a memory of my school years surfaced in my mind, my wife's bewildered reaction to the question about her plans for the future. It suddenly dawned on me that she must have dropped out of school to hide her pregnancy. This realization hit me like a brick. All these years, I have believed that we have no secrets, that we are absolutely transparent with each other. But now, faced with this revelation, I couldn't help but question everything I thought I knew about our relationship. Despite all her grandiosity, she managed to keep this crushing secret in plain sight all these years. As much as it shocked me, there was no time to think. The divorce proceedings were already in full swing, and I realized that I could not afford any vulnerabilities or weaknesses. I had to gather all my strength and fight for my life with this newfound determination. Our moment had come, it was time to appear before the judge and state our position. My lawyer cleared his throat, ready to address the court and state our position. The lawyer's allegations of infidelity on my part have no basis whatsoever. The submitted photos and questions do not provide grounds for such an accusation. On the contrary, we have concrete evidence indicating that it is his client who leads a debauched lifestyle. I ask the court to consider evidence A, B, and C, which are clear and indisputable evidence of the open confession of my client's spouse to deceptive behavior caused by financial motives. These actions are in direct contradiction with the traits that one would expect from a trustworthy and honest person. It is embarrassing that the opposing party's lawyer distorts our actions and my client's actions in this way. We strongly dispute the claim that the defense needs financial support. Document D clearly indicates that she has a lucrative place of work and is quite capable of supporting herself. Any claims to the contrary are misleading and require further investigation. If her lawyer insists otherwise, we require him to provide bank documents as proof of his rightness. The truth will be established as a result of a thorough study of the facts. My client is caught in a web of deception and manipulation, and he wants to get out of it without any financial losses. We are confident that the court will recognize the validity of this request, my lawyer firmly stated. The judge paused, giving time for reflection before proceeding to examine the evidence presented. Every piece of evidence was carefully studied, and the courtroom held its breath in anticipation. When the last exhibit, Evidence D, was announced, which presented indisputable proof that my wife is currently working, her face lost color. The weight of the evidence and the understanding that she had deceived were felt in the hall. The photos presented without a doubt depicted my wife, who just a week ago was actively working in a club for thrill-seekers, extravagantly dressed in expensive outfits and jewelry. This revelation seemed to have confused her lawyer and caused distrust in her own family when the dirty web of deception she had woven unraveled in front of everyone. I couldn't help but feel a surge of triumph throughout this ordeal. I alone withstood all the blows, and each of them turned out to be merciless. Admitting my guilt for giving her another chance and choosing the path of weakness, I felt a deep lack of remorse. It was my turn to strike and regain control of my life. The final and most devastating blow was dealt when my lawyer called Nancy to the witness stand. When Nancy got up, my wife's face turned even paler and I couldn't help but smile. With each question from the lawyer, Nancy confirmed her identity and admitted that she had previously worked in the same club as Jennifer, my once beloved wife. Under relentless questioning, Nancy told how Jennifer, while intoxicated, shamelessly flaunted her newfound wealth and revealed her own lies to her husband. The courtroom was taken over by Nancy's testimony, which further revealed the depth of my wife's deception. When my lawyer asked about a specific photo of Nancy and me, she calmly explained that she had contacted me to report Jennifer's infidelity. In addition, Nancy explained that she had nothing to fear since she had already resigned from the club. She made it clear that the photo presented was not proof of any infidelity on my part. In support of her words, she presented an audio recording of our conversation. As the tape played in the courtroom, my wife's face became more and more unhappy. It was obvious that she assumed that I didn't have any proof, and if I didn't, then maybe I would have succumbed to her deception. The recording served as a powerful means of exposing her lies and confirmed my desire for the truth. When the truth was revealed and there were no more shadows hiding it, 
my wife's facade collapsed in front of everyone. The audio recording presented as evidence was the last blow that left no room for doubt. When the recording ended, the judge turned his stern gaze on my wife and her lawyer. In a measured tone, the judge addressed both sides. Both sides presented their arguments regarding alimony. If you want to make any additional statements, please do so before I make my decision, he said. Anticipating a possible outburst of anger from my wife, I prepared myself, but to my surprise, she was silent, burying her face in her hands. Obviously, the weight of the truth had fallen on her, and she had no words left. When my wife's family and even her own lawyer cast disappointed and disgusted glances at her, a heavy silence reigned in the courtroom. All eyes were on her as the whole truth dawned on her. In this gloomy atmosphere, the judge broke the silence again. As for alimony, the judge began, I believe that the plaintiff does not have sufficient grounds to demand their payment. The weight of his words hung in the air, marking the final decision in this turbulent process. The final decision of the judge granted the petition for divorce. In an instant, I was officially divorced and got the freedom I so longed for. As I left the courtroom, a wide grin spread across my face, reminiscent of the smile of a child who has just gotten away with something naughty. From that moment on, I never spoke or saw Jennifer again. This moment had a bittersweet tinge, although, in truth, it was primarily sweet. The bitterness was from the realization that I had spent so much time and effort on a person like her. At the same time, I could not deny the great gratitude I felt for my private detective. He really was my savior, who saved me from an avalanche of lies and deception, who revealed the truth that set me free. He not only saved my wallet, but also saved me from a huge emotional shock. If there had been a Nobel Prize for saving gullible husbands, he would undoubtedly have won it. This victory is dedicated to him, the one who tirelessly listened and diligently unraveled the web of deception. I am eternally grateful to him. Later, it turned out that this lying woman, whom I loved and trusted so much, gave birth to a daughter when I was studying abroad, from some visiting guy whom she no longer saw after their intimacy. This girl was raised by my ex-wife's parents, who hid the truth from me. I hope that after everyone, including her family, found out how deceitful and vile this woman is, they will no longer want to communicate with her, and I sincerely hope that in the future, she will live a terrible and difficult life. I think she deserves it. Story 3 The story I want to share happened in 2021, that is, two and a half years ago. I want to keep my identity a secret because this story is not related to me and my husband. We have lived in a happy marriage for a wonderful 14 years. Instead, an unpleasant incident occurred between my mother, a delightful 59-year-old woman, and my father, a wise 63-year-old man. This once again reminds us that infidelity is not peculiar only to young women, sometimes, older women can also be involved in it. Ironically, before this incident, they had lived in a happy marriage for more than 38 years. Everything changed last Thursday, changing the rest of my parents' lives. Three years ago, they decided to retire to the picturesque state of Arizona. There, they purchased a posh plot on the riverbank and invested in a new diesel truck equipped with a camper. From October to April, they enjoyed the joys of Arizona life. They devoted the rest of the year to interesting travel, often going to cooler places such as mountainous areas or the captivating West Coast. And they certainly devoted four to six weeks to communicating with my family against the backdrop of the sublime landscapes of beautiful Utah. In order to provide maximum comfort to my parents during their visits, my husband took the initiative to organize a comprehensive parking for vans on our territory. They have convenient access to electricity, water, and a septic tank, which allows them to fully enjoy their vacation. Their presence on our large 16-acre plot never ceases to delight my husband, children, and me. Similarly, we look forward to our trips to their Arizona abode, which always turn out to be fascinating with their boat and jet ski at our disposal. We even go on a trip in the scorching heat of midsummer. In addition, my brother and his family, who live in Georgia, visit our parents at least once a year, which further enhances the joy of meeting them. Although they may not be able to visit us as often as we do, my brother and his family try to spend time with our parents. Until recently, I was very proud to say that my parents lived in an exemplary marriage. They were a shining example for my brother and me, instilling in us the values on which we raised our families. 
In a sense, our family life was the embodiment of the standard of the American dream. Now I'm going to tell you about how everything changed dramatically. There were many kind and friendly people in the wonderful area where my parents lived in Arizona, but among this warmth, one woman stood out for reasons I didn't understand. There was some indescribable quality in her that just didn't suit me. As part of this story, we will call her Josephine, a 64-year-old divorced woman who led a debauched lifestyle and was distinguished by noisy and obnoxious behavior. To my surprise, my mother developed a strong bond with Josephine, which caused an unusual friendship. This connection was a serious signal for me that caused concern. My mother is not by nature a fan of noisy parties and only occasionally takes part in social events. Surprisingly, several of mom's friends fell in love with Josephine despite her sometimes annoying behavior. Despite the fact that I have repeatedly expressed my suspicions about Josephine to my mother, she did not pay attention to my concerns, firmly believing that Josephine posed no danger and had a pure heart of gold. But it was at this moment that circumstances began to change for the worse. A few months ago, Josephine bought a yacht with the help of my father. Having received recommendations from her parents on its operation, the events that unfolded last Tuesday further spoiled the situation. At about 6 p.m., my mother, Josephine, and another friend whom I will call Ginny decided to go for a drink at happy hour. They decided to gather at a local river bar, using Josephine's newly acquired yacht as a means of transportation. It was planned that for several hours they would enjoy a drink and talk by the water. But my father told me that around 8 o'clock, his mother called him and said that their walk would be extended for another hour. During the conversation, my mother casually mentioned that they had unexpectedly met one of Josephine's acquaintances. Intriguingly, this meeting prompted them to make an impromptu visit to this man's house on the riverbank. This event was another wake-up call because my mother further expanded her plans for the evening. In addition, the identity of this mysterious friend remained unknown. Surprisingly, these circumstances did not bother my father, and as a result, my mother returned home shortly after 9 o'clock in the evening. At first, everything seemed normal. The next day, Wednesday, passed without any notable incidents, but it was on Thursday that events took an unexpected turn. The three women developed a plan to revisit the bar in order to relax and have a drink at happy hour on the terrace. This event was the fourth alarm signal in this story. As already mentioned, my mother rarely drinks alcohol, but in a few days, she twice ventured out of the house to socialize and drink in her free time. Such a dramatic change in behavior was an unmistakable alarm signal. Meanwhile, that evening, my father and Jenny's husband were going to devote time to work on their cars. Therefore, the ladies' walk presented no problem from the point of view of the conflict of schedules. The trio departed by boat around 6.30 p.m., agreeing to return no later than 9 p.m. Meanwhile, my dad and Jenny's husband finished the renovations around 8 p.m. After which, my father went home and took a shower. Soon he noticed a missed call from my mother, which made him curious. Intrigued, he immediately called her back. In the conversation, mom asked her father to pick her up as she wanted to return home, Despite the fact that Josephine and Jenny were going to extend the walk understanding her fears, her father agreed and followed her to the bar. During the short trip home, my mother looked normal on the outside, but looking back, the father noted that he led most of the conversation and my mother mostly listened. Upon arriving home, my mother knelt down in front of her father and hugged his legs tightly, pressing her head to his stomach. At first, the father thought that she was initiating an intimate moment, but quickly realized that she was crying. He gently lifted her up, calmed her down, hugged her, and gently asked about what happened to her. Suddenly, mom plucked up the courage and confessed her betrayal to her father. Naturally, he was caught off guard and could only reply with a puzzled what. When the confirmation sounded in their conversation, the father was in a state of deep shock, unable to fully realize the severity of his wife's confession. Despite a shock, he remained a support for my mother, hugging her tightly as she cried inconsolably. This revelation was simply incredible in scale. After 38 years of marriage and 40 years of living together, their union up to this point seemed flawless. No wonder my father was in a state of shock in the face of such a deep betrayal. Gradually realizing the gravity of reality, the father made the difficult decision to postpone their conversation until the morning, gently persuading his mother to take a shower. 
He barely forced her to pull away from him, nevertheless, he took her to the bathroom where she could refresh herself. After she left, her father calmly told her that she would sleep in a separate bedroom that night. Despite her pleas and desperate requests to join her, he remained adamant in his decision, assuring her that they would sort out the situation in the morning. During the night, my mother could not calm down and fall asleep. Her thoughts were absorbed by the weight of her actions. Throughout the restless night, mom kept trying to look in the bedroom door, feeling an urgent need to talk to her father. Each time, he lovingly begged her to rest and assured her that they would definitely talk in the morning. Eventually, fatigue took its toll and she fell asleep around 5.30 in the morning. The next morning, she woke up at 8 o'clock and saw that her father was not there and he had moved all his personal belongings to a camper overnight. This act symbolized his final decision to break up with her, which meant that he no longer wanted to continue their relationship. The full weight of his disappointment became clear, he had reached the point where his connection with her became irreparable. In the face of my mother's infidelity, my father showed firm determination to deal with the situation. Despite the fact that they had lived together for four decades, the father coped with this difficult situation with amazing endurance. He skillfully moved his things without causing mom any trouble. Their bedroom had a sliding door that conveniently opened onto the patio, which allowed him to discreetly collect clothes and personal belongings and load them into the van before leaving. At first, my mother tried to contact him by phone, but he did not answer. Instead, he chose to communicate with her via text messages, setting the tone for their further conversations. On the morning of April 9th, at exactly 6 o'clock, the official separation of my parents took place. This news knocked mom out of her routine. In desperation, she dialed her father's number again, and this time he answered in a calm manner. He repeated the words written in the message. He said that he was filing for divorce and would live in a camper until the process was completed. Despite my mother's requests to enter into a conversation with him to give her an opportunity to explain herself, he made it clear that he was not interested in this. In the last conversation before the end, my father told my mother that she would receive information from his lawyer as soon as he hired him. In addition, he said that he had already contacted Jenny's husband, who was at the party with my mother and Josephine at that moment. Although the details are unknown to me, it seems that Jenny's husband found out about her infidelity and subsequently kicked her out of the house. Jenny is currently seeking temporary refuge with Josephine while they are going through this turbulent period. After talking with my mother, my father turned to my brother and me to tell the bitter news. At first, we were taken aback, thinking that this was some kind of evil joke, but when the seriousness of the situation became clear, emotions overwhelmed me, bringing me to tears. Since then, my mom's emotional state has deteriorated significantly. During the last week, in search of my father, she stubbornly traveled from one campsite to another, covering an amazing distance of more than 1,500 kilometers. My brother and I know where my father is, but we promise not to tell her about it. My brother and I stand firmly on my father's side, providing him with constant support in this difficult situation because he is undoubtedly a victim. At the same time, we are worried about our mother. Her unbalanced behavior, lack of appetite and sleep, as well as the frantic search for her father, make us fear for her well-being. The constant fear that she may get into an accident, have a heart attack, or even harm herself haunts us, especially since she has repeatedly spoken about her unwillingness to live without her father. Now we are faced with an urgent question, is it worth revealing our father's whereabouts to lessen our mother's anxiety? But given that our father has explicitly asked for confidentiality, it is important to respect his wishes and maintain the trust he has placed in us. If we report his whereabouts, it could jeopardize our trust and relationship with him. Although we can inform our mother of his whereabouts, it may bring her temporary peace of mind, but it can also hurt if she breaks her promise and starts looking for him. Ultimately, our priority should be to support the father in this difficult time as well as ensuring the well-being of the mother in other ways. In this difficult situation, where our father was completely shocked by our mother's actions, it is very important that we respect his request for confidentiality and maintain his trust. Of all, we must provide constant support to our father, who, in fact, is a victim in this situation. It is clear that I, as a daughter, may have conflicting thoughts and emotions, but we must remain steadfast in our desire to fully support our father, no matter how difficult it may be. 
we must allow our mother to face the problems associated with responsibility for her actions. If you need advice on what steps to take next, it may be useful to seek advice from a reliable family friend, counselor, or psychotherapist who can give an objective assessment and support during this difficult time. Yesterday, my mother was in the St. George area, looking hard for my father. For those who don't know, St. George is located in southwest Utah. To support and protect her, I managed to persuade my mother to come to our house and stay with us for a few nights. Fortunately, she agreed, and she is expected to arrive this afternoon. A number of profound events have occurred over the past 10 days. My mother came to my house in a clearly depressed state and looked very bad. After a short conversation, we accepted her and allowed her to relax in one of the bedrooms. But less than an hour later, my youngest daughter, coming out of the bedroom, began to persistently call me to her. When I ran there, I saw that my mother was writhing in convulsions, squeezing her lower abdomen and pelvic area, unable to move. In such a difficult situation, my husband quickly carried her to the car, deciding to urgently seek medical help. We hurried to the emergency room, observing severe discomfort and sweating, as well as obvious signs of high fever. At the hospital, doctors considered the possibility of infection, possibly urinary tract infection, and offered to take various tests. In addition, treatment for severe dehydration was prescribed. Later, it turned out that my mother had contracted a sexually transmitted disease as a result of intimacy. Fortunately, the sexually transmitted disease that mom acquired is treatable with antibiotics. The doctor advised her to stay in the hospital overnight until her temperature drops and her general well-being improves. Unfortunately, after 48 hours, there was no visible progress in her condition. At that moment, the situation changed for the worse. The doctor expressed fears that she may be dealing with a drug-resistant type of venereal disease, which has become increasingly widespread in recent years. In this regard, she was prescribed a combination of potent antibiotics. After five days, the temperature dropped and the condition became stable. She was discharged from the hospital only yesterday. Throughout her stay in the hospital, mom often asked about dad, wanting to know if he had contacted her to inquire about her well-being. To be honest, I told her that he hadn't made a single call, but I assured her that I gave him the latest news every day. My family and I visited her every day to support and communicate. We made sure that she did not stay alone for a long time, trying to prevent the feeling of loneliness. Unfortunately, this approach seems to have increased her sense of depression. Currently, back in a cozy home, mom seems to be making physical progress on the road to recovery, but her emotional state remains unstable. Since returning, she has been constantly writing and calling dad, desperately looking for communication with him. Disappointed and dejected, she says, after 40 years of living together, I think you will at least talk to me. When I heard this, I got angry and attacked her with insulting words. I said, if you hadn't behaved like that, none of this would have happened. It's all your fault, you destroyed our family. Although there was undeniable truth in these words, remorse seized me almost immediately, and I immediately apologized to her. Overwhelmed with emotion, she burst into tears, clinging tightly to me. We had a long conversation, more than two hours, during which she opened up and told the whole truth. The person with whom mom entered into an intimate relationship turned out to be a 28-year-old builder who worked at a nearby facility. It turned out that this guy, despite the significant age difference of 31 years, actively entered into a relationship with a married woman. His behavior can only be described as disrespectful and contemptuous. Together with two comrades, he decided to rent a trailer by the river for a long time, six months, instead of staying in a hotel. Now, unfortunately, we have come to the darker part of the story. According to mom, she was in contact with this man on Tuesday, while Josephine and Jenny were involved in a romantic relationship with two other people. Yes, it may seem shocking, but that's exactly how it was. But on Thursday, his courtship so captured her that she could not resist intimacy with him. When I heard this news, I was deeply disgusted and shocked. I could not imagine that my own mother could behave in such a way. Despite her growing discomfort and unwillingness to discuss this topic, I stubbornly continued to insist on my own. I kept wondering how she could betray her father in such a way. In response to my questions, she only sincerely did not understand what was happening. 
she admitted that she immediately felt remorse as soon as she and the man began their actions. Now, thinking about it and retelling the details, she feels very ashamed. I am incredibly grateful to my mother for having the courage to confess to my father, even though it must have been incredibly difficult for her. The idea that she unknowingly passed on a venereal disease to dad is a really terrifying scenario, and it's very good that it didn't come true. This could lead to a catastrophic turn of events and a huge tragedy. Despite this, mom does not lose hope that her father will return, but it seems that he has already decided everything, and he has a reputation for not canceling his decisions. In this regard, mom plans to leave on Saturday and continue searching for her father, not knowing what to expect. On Friday, she planned a thorough search in all the campsites of the southwest region. Her determination keeps her going forward despite the uncertainty of what lies ahead. There's something I know but can't share with her. It is important that she listens to this. My father arranged to hand over the divorce papers to my mother at my house. He wants her to be in the presence of her family to provide her with support during this difficult time. Friday promises to be an incredibly difficult day full of emotional turmoil. I feel guilty because I know what is going to happen. Despite this, I feel obligated to help my father in this process. In addition, it is important for me to be close to my mother when she faces difficulties. More than a year has passed, and mom and dad are really divorced, and this reality is still difficult for me to comprehend. In addition to the news of the divorce, it is extremely important to shed light on what has been happening in their lives since then. My father, unable to forgive my mother for her betrayal, remained firm in his position. He is a steadfast and principled person who makes it clear that he will not accept betrayal so easily. Therefore, he decided not to communicate with his mother except for their meetings during the divorce proceedings. My father's quick decision to cut my mother out of his life came as a surprise to me, but I understand the depth of his resentment and the need to distance himself. It is worth noting that despite the fact that their personal relationships suffered, the father ensured a fair distribution of financial resources during the divorce process. Mom received generous compensation. The main goal of the father was to get out of the marriage as soon as possible and break off relations with her. Although it pains me to acknowledge this reality, I can empathize with his feelings of betrayal and disrespect. Currently, my mother lives in a modest apartment not far from her house. As already mentioned, she used to live in a magnificent house on the banks of a river in Arizona, which was accompanied by boats, jet skis, and a camper. Together, mom and dad went on summer adventures, exploring the coasts and mountains all over the country. I can only imagine how much regret she feels for sacrificing so much for the sake of fleeting excitement. It is unpleasant to realize that she has exchanged a temporary indulgence for such long-term consequences but I will not dwell on this because there is another important point to dwell on. If from the point of view of the father, the divorce process looked fast and efficient, then the same cannot be said about the mother. Unfortunately, after the divorce process was completed, her health immediately deteriorated. As a result of the deterioration of her condition, she was hospitalized with bronchitis, dehydration, malnutrition, and severe depression. As a result, she had to spend three days in the hospital, where she received treatment and medication to address mental health issues. The prescribed medications, as it turned out, had a positive effect, stabilized her mental state, and led to calmness. At the same time, against the background of these difficulties, she received an additional test in the form of a possible diagnosis of lupus, which was probably provoked by excessive stress associated with divorce and the loss of her father. According to the doctor, severe stress can weaken the immune system, which leads to an exacerbation of diseases resembling lupus. Considering that mom was struggling with sexually transmitted diseases and bacterial bronchitis, it is obvious that her immune system is currently weakened. In this regard, the doctor gave my mother individual recommendations aimed at strengthening immunity and effective management of stress levels. To restore control over the overall well-being, mom needs to actively engage in relaxation and stress reduction. It is encouraging that she has made remarkable progress in her recovery over the past six months. Unfortunately, mom's current condition is far from the strong and calm woman she once was. Now, she looks fragile, broken, and deprived of her former vital energy. Despite this, a few months ago, I managed to get her a job at a craft store where my friend works as a manager. 
it is noteworthy that she copes with her duties perfectly and receives praise for being an outstanding employee. If she's lucky, this job will help her find a new purpose, but the harsh reality remains grim. She has lost many of the benefits she once enjoyed. Currently, mom is taking medications prescribed by a doctor to cope with her condition. The constant struggle with stress is exhausting, but she tries hard to keep her emotions under control. Her housing situation has also changed significantly. Now, she lives in a modest apartment not far from me. At the age of 59, she returned to work in retail, which marks a dramatic change in her life. But let's switch the focus from mom to dad. Apparently, he does not waste time in vain, enjoying his newfound freedom. He has completely switched to a nomadic lifestyle, traveling on his own in his camper and seems to be enjoying his free state. My father has a deep love for nature and is fond of exploring new places. Over the past six months, he has started a relationship with a woman, and it seems that they are developing into something significant. But I advise him to be careful, given the recent dissolution of a 40-year marriage with my mother. Although I have met her many times and can confirm her good-natured nature and her attitude towards my father, there is one curious point that it is difficult for me to express without sounding ironic, she is much younger than him. They are united by a passion for travel, as the girl is a blogger on YouTube and talks about her adventures. Over the past four months, Dad and his girlfriend have gone on various hikes across the country. Although she doesn't talk about my father on her YouTube channel, she mentions him in some of her videos. Their relationship seems really strong, and Dad himself says that he is happier than ever before. But despite his newfound happiness, he reassured my brother and me that he was not going to get married again. Interestingly, his girlfriend holds the same opinion.